Welcome to The Encouraging Word, featuring the Bible-based preaching of Dr. Don Wilton. You're going to need to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. It's wonderful to be together like this. You and I are the center of God's focus and His attention. During these next several weeks, God is going to speak to your heart. He's speaking to mine. Even as I have prepared a series entitled Walking with God's Giants, God has been gripping my own heart. And I'm praying for you today. I'm calling you out as a people because the Lord Jesus has an encouraging word for you. My friends, you and I are living in a rapidly changing and turbulent world. And everyone who worships the Lord today, all of us, we have so many issues and things and circumstances, do we not? In just a moment, I'm going to invite you to account for yourself before God. And we're going to begin with Abraham. I want to read a passage to you and I want to share some very deep things that the Lord has put in my heart. Look at what God's Word tells us in Genesis chapter 15. You need to see this. And really our focal point will be in verse 6. After these things, the Word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your reward will be very great. Isn't that a great, powerful statement? I so badly just wanted to preach on that this morning. Can you imagine God said that? Do you know that He's saying that to you today? Fear not. I'm your shield, and your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. See, Abraham had a predicament. He knew God was speaking to him, but he was still trying to balance the necessities of life. He wanted everything to work out right. Verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, this man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside, and he said to him, Abram, look toward heaven, and number the stars, if you are able to number them. And so God said to him, so shall your offspring be. And then look at verse 6, and Abraham believed God. Isn't that a beautiful statement? How are you doing in the believing department? Abraham believed the Lord and God counted it to him as righteousness. <clears throat> if I was privileged to say anything to you today, to pass on an encouraging word to you, I, I would just stop right there. Abraham believed God. We have such a crisis of belief. It's so powerful. This morning we were reminded even what Jesus said to his disciples. Just before he was crucified, Listen to this. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. 
What's the next statement? Believe in God. Believe also in me. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. And because I am Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, believe in me. And he goes on and explains the wonderful hope that we can place, the confidence that we can have in and through the Lord Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? So now let's roll it all the way back into the Old Testament. This is before Jesus came. But God's focus was exactly the same. His intended purpose for us never changed. Remember that God made you. He created you. You don't have to continue living like you are. And the essential ingredient here is that Abraham believed God. So let me just put this in, in, a, in a framework, if you don't mind. I, I want to give you a little bit of background here, because there's so much. We know a lot about Abraham. Um, he began in a place called Ur. Ur, you are Ur of the Chaldeans. And he grew up there. He was a very wealthy man, we are led to understand. He had it made and uh, was very successful. The Bible doesn't tell us a lot about his background, but he had a, a dramatic encounter with God, and God changed everything in the context of his blessings. You and I find so often that we, it's almost as though we fear, don't we? We fear that if we completely trust God, that somehow the blessings are going to suffer. And the exact opposite is true. When you let go and you just take God at His word, blessings abound. And Abraham, certainly that was true in his life, wasn't it? And there are some deeply significant things that Abraham did that I want to know about. Yeah, here's what I want to know. I want to know what it is that Abraham did that caused God to bless him like that. And there's a lot that can be said about Abraham. Let me just share a couple of things. That, that mark the belief of this man. First of all, he was a seeking man. He was a seeking man. His story is replete with that. You can start way back there in chapter 12, verse 8, and you can go through all the life of Abraham, and you're going to find three things that happened in his deeply prolific, engaged search after the heart of God, it seems like he just frequently stopped. In his search for God, he stopped to search for God. Some of us are just too jolly well busy. You know, my wife and I have just enjoyed two weeks vacation. There's something... Yes, you know, you can say, well, you know, you did this and you walked down this road and you held hands and you went fishing and you did. But there's just something about stopping. Do you know what your problem may be right now? You're just not willing to stop. That's a discipline. I'm not talking about like an official vacation. Abraham stopped, but his, his stopping was purpose-driven. He not only stopped, but he worshipped. He engaged himself. In fact, the Bible tells us in chapter 12 and verse 8, and then you read this recurring theme, that he went to this place, he made a sacrifice, and he worshipped God. 
One of the reasons God gave us Sunday is for that purpose. Do you know that? Do you know that you are not wasting your time? You are engaging the best of your time by stopping to worship the Lord. How many of us today, in all honesty, you just can't wait to get out and get going and get on with it? Well, we're all like that. I'm a, I tend to have ants in my pants. We all like that. We're all on the move. But the fact that you stop and you worship, he not only stopped worship, but he listened. There was, a, there was something that took place with this believing man that was part of the essential spiritual ingredient He was a seeking man. His heart, Abraham, with all his sin and all his waywardness and all the detours that he took and, and all the setbacks that he suffered, he was a man searching after the heart of God. Are you? Number two, he was a giving man. You can't avoid that. Bible tells us two things about his giving. You can read, for example, in chapter 14 and verse 20, after having engaged the enemy, after having won great battles, after having been assisted by those who cared for him, he just gave back. He gave them a tenth of everything that he did. Tenth of his resources. He said, look, I'm... I'm going to respond. But he didn't just give of his resources. He gave of his kindness. Don't you love the story about Abraham and Lot? You know, Lot was his nephew, and they got after it, and they had people and people who served people and other people who served other people, and eventually all the people were just getting on each other's nerves. By the way, can you think of someone right now that's getting on your nerves? I didn't ask you to do that to him. I'm just saying, <laughs> right, do we not, would you all agree with me that there are people that get on your nerves? Right? Someone said yes out loud. <laughs> Am I engaging somewhere? Do you know that there are some very difficult people in this world? I'm not talking about anybody here. I'm talking about, you know, in Alabama. <laughs> uh, number three, he was an obedient man. He was an obedient man. Replete right throughout the story of Abraham was his extraordinary obedience. I mean, it just floors me. God spoke, he listened, and he did it. He listened carefully, and he acted decisively. Those were the two hallmarks of his obedience. And you know that obedience is the hallmark of Christian discipleship. It begins with our salvation. Salvation is being obedient because you capitulate and you give. You step back. You see yourself in the light of God's holiness and His glory, and you step back and away from yourself, and you capitulate in complete obedience to the Lordship of Christ. And fellowship is giving yourself in complete obedience. It's listening to God and acting on Him. Do you know the only two responsibilities we have as a church? Our response, our job is... Malta, our job is to go to Haiti. Our job is to reach people for Christ. Our job is to sing and lead us in worship so beautifully as the praise team and the, the orchestra and the sanctuary choir do. That's our job. But our, our responsibility as a church is to listen to what God is saying to us and then to act decisively on what He says. That's our job as a church. If we can fine-tune those two things, everything else falls into place. <laughs> because it's the very hallmark of our Christian faith, isn't it? 
That's what he did. I remember we're going to get to the point that he believed God, and as a result, God counted it to him for righteousness. God conferred the greatest honor on this man in terms of the full gamut of all that God is was placed upon this man Abraham. I want that. I want God to place his mantle of righteousness on me. And I want him to place that on you. And Abraham shows us how it happened. Because he pleased God. He was an obedient man. He was a tested man. You can't talk about Abraham without talking about the test of Abraham, thinking of Isaac, for example, his own son. We all love that most powerful, heart-wrenching story that is so difficult to comprehend. So difficult to comprehend. As I came into worship this morning, I got a text from my own daughter who's in a faraway place, in a very difficult place. She said, I'm about to do this and that and the other. And I'm sitting here as a father this morning thinking of my daughter. My daughter, and she's, she's working and she's engaged, and, but she's in a very difficult place and and serve him just like our people did in Haiti. Like, this man, Abraham, get this, guys, get this. God didn't say to him, listen, man, would you be okay if I just sent Isaac off to North Africa to go and be a missionary over there? I mean, he said, no, no, no. He said, let me tell you what to do. Get your own son, march him up that mountain there, strap him up, and execute him. Let's not mince our words over this. Just take your son... Just stab him to death right there, spill his blood and sacrifice him. Burn him alive. I'm getting graphic. Have you got that? Now what's your problem? You and I become so mealy moused. We're like a bunch of little mice running around with our tails between our legs saying, God, would you bless us? But we don't even get on the first base. God's not asking any of us to sacrifice our sons and daughters in the manner with which God spoke to Abraham, but it was the test of his faith. And by the way, there were two things that just struck me about this test, that he was not tested differently because of his age. This was one old man. He and Sarah were already beyond child-bearing age when God blessed them with Isaac, and we know all the story related to that. God's test of our lives does not diminish with our age. How many times you and I, we turn 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 90, and we say, well, God's done with us. No, He is not. This is the didn't diminish with his age. And I'll tell you another thing, that he was not tested minimally due to his status. By the way, this man had status. Abraham, by this time, with I, he was a very prominent citizen. He owned everything. He was a wealthy man. He had status. People respected him everywhere. He was the head of the whole shouting match. But God's test did not diminish because he was an older man, and God's test was not minimized because of his status. In fact, it seems to me like the older he got, the more God put it on him. And the more he had, the more God put it on him. It's really quite something. Of course, that brings up that culminating point, he was a believing man. That's where it comes up when you get into chapter 15 and verse 6. He was a believing man. Just turn in your Bibles to chapter 25. Go to Genesis 25. I want to show you something just so beautiful here. Chapter 25 and verse 8. 
chapter 25 and verse 8. We know in the preceding verse that he was 175 years old. <laughs> That's something, isn't it? I don't want to live to be 175. I I think I'd get quite grumpy by then. But at any rate, he was 175. But look at verse 8. Abraham breathed his last. He died in good old age. Good old age. God defined the goodness of his status in life. An old man, look, look at this word here, full of years. You know, I just thank God because in my life and ministry here in our beautiful church, one of the great joys I've had, and you, we've all had, but I'm going to tell you, one of the great joys I've had is sitting at the feet of so many of our beloved elders in this congregation who in their latter years have been so full of years they're such beautiful people. And I look, I'm looking at people right now. I so badly want to call out names. You've got up there into your 80s and now you're such a beautiful man. You're such a beautiful lady. You're full of years. Now watch what happened here. Look at this, verse 8. And as a result, I love this, he was gathered to his people. He was gathered to his people. That is just brilliant. He believed God. God counted it to him, conferred this on him as a result of having pleased God because he just took God at his word. He searched for God and, and he loved God. He gave to God. He he just, he just poured out his life. He was just obedient. This is the raw daughter. <laughs> he, he was a believing man, and the Bible says he just died full of years, full of years, having been conferred upon by the very righteous hand of Almighty God. And watch this. And he was gathered to his people. You know those funeral services you and I go to? And you can just feel the love. Just the, the love. As the person who has gone on to heaven is being gathered to his or her people. It's just a it's just a spiritual, wow, God, thank you for this lady. She just was such a blessing all her life. And thank you for this man. And thank you for my grandpa. Thanks for my grandmother. Thank you for my daddy. Thank you for my mama. Thank you for my son. Thank you for my daughter. Just was gathered to his people. He believed God. I want to say to you, thank you. You're making a difference. And I want to say to you, you can make a difference. This is intended for all of us. Indeed, great things are taking place as God is moving, if God is moving in your heart. I pray you'd be willing to share that with someone. Maybe God has changed your life from the inside out. Let us be one of those that you let know. Give us a call at that 866-899-WORD number. It will connect you not just right now, but 24 hours a day with someone who'd love to pray with you. Matter of fact, right now, I want to pray, Lord, for those that right now understand that they've been playing like I did in my own life, playing church, playing religion. 
And now they have come to you, Jesus, as Savior and Lord. I pray you would help us to grow closer to you every day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know we have some great resources that will help you grow in that walk. Maybe help answer some questions about what God's doing in your own life. Let us pray with you. The 866-899-WORD number will connect you with us right now, and we love to talk. You can also meet us online at theencouragingword.org. Till next time, take care. One life, one message, Jesus Christ. God can use you to change the world. Join Dr. Wilton as he shares the life-changing message, The Power of a Personal Testimony, which includes a special tribute to Dr. Billy Graham. Plus, as a very special thank you for your generous support, you will also receive Through My Father's Eyes by Franklin Graham, a book written from the perspective of the son who knew him best. Both of these ministry resources are a must-have for all of God's people. You will learn how to share your testimony with others and be inspired by Dr. Billy Graham's example. Request these two life-changing resources as you give a generous gift of any amount to The Encouraging Word this month. Write to us at Post Office Box 2110, Spartanburg, South Carolina, 29304, or call us toll-free at 866-899-WORD, or visit online at theencouragingword.org. Thank you for your partnership, impacting hearts and lives for Jesus Christ around the world. Our time is gone, but we're still connecting online at theencouragingword.org and 866-899-WORD. Hello, my friends. Thank you for watching The Encouraging Word on YouTube. If you were blessed by this message, would you like it, comment, and perhaps would you subscribe and get connected with us? In fact, if you want to discover more about The Encouraging Word, visit our website at tewonline.org. God bless you today.